Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Battersby. This is Alan Eldridge, my partner in crime, or my partner in Hex, as I like to think of him at work. Uh, so we're going to be talking about interpreting dense data uh, with Tableau. First thing that we, we noticed, and we were just up here chatting a little bit um, beforehand, we noticed that the room is not particularly dense today. Um, so we're not going to be able to do any live demos with, you know, like spatial binning across the room or anything like that, um, just because, you know, the density isn't quite high enough. But hopefully, hopefully the, um, the other demos that we have will be sufficient. So just a little background on uh, why, why we got started giving this talk. Um, Alan and I are, are good office hex friends. We met a few years ago because um, he was doing some, some hex-related office work, and turned out I also really liked office hex. And, Kind of and we've, been make, we've been making these lame jokes ever <laughs> since. Uh, so just, just to, to give you a sense of what we're going to be going through, um, we've both got some sets of demos. So we're going to be building up some Tableau workbooks, both spatial data and non-spatial data. So how can you deal with the, the large, dense data sets that you might be struggling with? And we're going to go through a number of different techniques, including augmenting the vises, um, slicing the data, dicing the data, different types of encoding, um, aggregating the data. So you'll see a lot of different examples that you can use as you're working through your data. And we've got a couple resources I just wanted to point out so that we have these front loaded um, so you don't, don't lose them at the end. Alan has a really great blog, The Last Data Bender, and so some of his materials end up there. Uh, I write some what I call random map commentary and how-to, so with respect to the spatial aspects of this, I have a blog on the community forums where I post a lot of how-to and educational material. And then um, we'll have workbooks from the talk that you can get from the TC website. I also have my dense data workbook um, up on Tableau Public right now, so you'll have access to that. I made it live this morning, so should you want to like go grab it right now, it's there for you. Sarah sells her blog down, but it's <coughs> really just super insightful stuff. It's cutting edge and your brain will bleed, so uh, But like in it, a out. it bleeds in a really good way. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Alan so he can start off with, with his demos. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Well, good morning, everybody. As Sarah said, I'm Alan. Um, as you can tell, I'm not from around here. Uh, I actually run the pre-sales team uh, down in Australia and New Zealand. I've uh, been with uh, Tableau for about six years, and Sarah and I have been kind of evolving this presentation. Uh, I think this is our third iteration of it now. So uh, as Sarah said, we, we really sort of started off this conversation because um, uh, I actually ran across uh, uh, another blog by um, Chris Erickson, and he uh, had, I don't know, these, these kind of squeaked in under the radar. There were a couple of... Um, uh, new functions that were included in Tableau Desktop, I think back in, in version 9 maybe even, and uh, this, this concept of hex binning, taking data and sort of clumping it together into related groups. Uh, so uh, we started playing around with it and I was sort of, if you just used a shape, um, as you kind of zoomed in and out, the problem would be that the shape didn't resize. So I kind of found a clever way to dynamically construct these hexagonal polygons and, and you could sort of resize them and then zoom in and zoom out and you didn't get that sharding kind of effect that would happen in here. So we, we sort of started doing some of that stuff and then um, we just sort of continued to bounce around and come up with some new ideas. So, you know, how would I take that and then start to apply it over a map with some data that I had and how could we start to do that efficiently? And then Sarah came back with some mind-blowing math that allowed us to not just do it in projection space but also allow us to do it so that we got equal-sized polygons. Um, I mean, it's not a huge problem for us in Australia because um, the the elongation due to the map projection doesn't happen too badly for us, but in the Northern Hemisphere, it's a much more noticeable problem. Uh, anyway, so in this talk, I'm not really going to talk about anything spatial. Um, my part of the presentation this morning is, is more to kind of lay some foundation stuff, just about, you know, what is dense data and, and uh, how are we going to deal with it. So um, I have some data that I'm going to play around with here. And it's a really, really simple data set. It's really just three columns. There's an X 
and a Y, because I want to start throwing it up onto a scatter plot. Um, and uh, there's an observation number, so basically just a row identifier so I can recognize each row independently of one another. Um, uh, I have 100,000 records that we're going to play with here. Um, so just by grabbing it and putting it up onto a single uh, tabular viz over here and then just presenting a couple of quick filters, uh, we immediately start to get some insight into this data. So we can see at this point um, that I, have, I can understand the range of my, my two dimensions in here. So X goes from minus 1.15 through to 11, and Y goes from 0 through to 12 in here. So immediately, I'm starting to get some understanding of my data. Let me hop out of presentation mode. Let's come over here. All right, well, so, so as I said, I've got a couple of dimensions, observation ID, X and Y. So maybe if I just start to pull this data out, and I'll put X here, I'll put Y here, and we'll put observation ID. You got a lot of data points. Are you sure you want to do this? Yeah, absolutely, because we can render 100,000 data points in a scatter plot. Um, and uh, so we can see here that really we've just got a great big blue blob. And it, it's very difficult for us to make uh, sense of how this, uh, how this looks deeper in down here. You know, where is the... Is there a, a focal point of our data where it is the most dense? We can't really see this through, through this view over here. Um, well, maybe there are a couple of simple and immediate techniques that we could apply. So right now, by default, the dots are this size. Well, what if we make them smaller? Well, that helps a little bit. Um, but again, now it's just a big blue blob with a fuzzy edge on it. Uh, and so again, we could maybe start to play around with the opacity of our, of our points in here. Again, um, the fuzziness around the edge, so it sort of helps me on the periphery, but it's really not helping me get insight into the, the, the depths of our dense data in here. So there's only so far you can go by fiddling around with the mark type um, and uh, things like size and opacity. On the right-hand side over here, though, you'll notice that I've also got surfaced up what we call the summary card, and it's not normally this big by default, um, but I've actually switched on all of the options that we have available in this. And so what I'm now starting to get at this point is a deeper understanding about our data, but we're doing it um, through statistical description of what our data looks like. So we're pulling up things like you know, the average, the min and the max, well, we already knew that. We got that from our range on our, um, uh, on our quick filters before. Uh, but now I start to get things like the median and the standard deviation. I get quartile distances um, away from the median. So if we look at uh, X, for example, um, we can see here that the median is 5, right about here. Uh, uh, but we can also see that the average is 5. So one of, when your median and your average are pretty close together, it tells you that you have a fairly even distribution. Um, as opposed to Y, for example, where you can see that our average is 1, but our median is 0.7. So there's a skew that we'll, we'll start to talk about in here. Uh, and then there's some um, more abstract measurements down here in terms of skewness and ketosis. So what do these things mean? Well, um, hopefully people are you know, sort of familiar with this concept of a normal distribution. Um, and so uh, when we're dealing with a normal distribution, um, we'll, we'll start to work with things like averages and standard deviations. So that's really just the, the distance between the, the average point in here and the distances out. Um, a single standard deviation is 34.1%, and the next one out is 13%. So as you go further and further out, you understand that you have more and more of the data within those boundaries. So it's a, a degree of certainty. Um, so looking at... Uh, these, these descriptive metrics like average, median, when we start to look at things like our quartiles, or what we basically do is we divide them up into, so we say from, from the first one to the last one, that's 100%. So the median is obviously 50%. The, the first quartile is 25%. So you know that 25% of the data marks are below that. So again, if you have tight uh, quartiles around the median, then you know that it's probably going to be a tall skinny curve uh, as opposed to a, a spread out flatter curve in here. So that then leads to the, the, the bottom one down here, which is our ketosis. And the ketosis is a, 
is a metric that describes the, the, the shape of the curve. Is it skinny or is it fat? Um, and then the skew tells us whether we have a lean in one direction or the other. So do we have a, a, a long tail either to the left or the right? So we can see that if we have uh, a positive skew, so if our skewness is a positive number, um, then we know that it's going to lead out in this direction. If it's a negative number, it's going to lead out in the other direction like this. So uh, one of the things that I could do is to take all of the data that we've got over here on this summary card and I could perhaps just you know, put together a simple little dashboard that shows me my scatter plot and then provides that statistical summary just in a floating text object next to it. So that would be one way, but we're Tableau people. We don't like to do it this way. We would prefer to do it in a, in a far more visual way and a far more interesting way as well. Would you agree? I mean, if you're happy with this, you can leave now, right? Because you've seen it all. All right. So um, we, we sort of saw some of those statistical summary charts. Um, and uh, one of the things that we might like to do is a, is a distribution plot of a, a couple of different forms. Um, so one of these things is a histogram or just a frequency polygon. So I've got uh, a sheet over here. So what I could do, um, so when we do a, a histogram, what we're going to do is we're going to create bins. Uh, and a bin is just a method of rounding so that a bunch of, I, I have a, a a bucket that, that points are going to fall into in here. And I want to know how many points are to fall into each one of these buckets. So your bins will be set to be a certain width apart. Now in Tableau, we've got a great way of doing this. We can come down here and we can just say create a bin in here. So that's a, and, and that's what I would recommend that you do most of the time. I'm not going to do that today for reasons which will become obvious later in the presentation, but this is what we would do. We would come in here, we would say create a bin, and I want my bins to be 0.1 units wide, and I can click OK, and I have this bin that I've now created. So I could bin the X and I could bin the Y. Uh, I'm not going to do that, uh, and so I've simply got a couple of calculations that really do exactly that. So all I'm doing in here is I'm looking at uh, my value, I scale it up by 10, I int it, and then I uh, divide it back down again. So it's just a rounding function to, to truncate it at a arbitrary value. Uh, it's by 10 because in this case I wanted to round it to a 0.1. Make sense? Okay, so I have one of these for x and I have one of these for y. Really simple calculation. But what I can do is bring this out. So this is my, uh, my X bin, so I'll bring this out over here. Uh, and then all I need to do is the number of records. So I can bring that out and plot this. And we get this frequency polygon being created, right? So it's a, it's a nice little histogram type chart. I'm gonna clean this up a little bit. Uh, so I'm gonna take these bins over here. Right now they're discrete, I'll make it continuous and I'll make it a fixed size of 0.1. That way my bars don't overlap and it's nice and neat, like so. So we can look at this and we can immediately see from this example that I have a pretty normal distribution for the X data in here. Um, I uh, would probably need to overlay some other stuff in here around um, you know, averages and standard deviations and stuff like that, which we could easily enough do, um, but what I'd also like to do, so this is, this is one approach, uh, and again, for reasons which will become apparent shortly, uh, one of the things that I want to do is I want to take this uh, and I'm just going to flip this upside down. And then I'm going to hide the header. I don't need that. I don't really need this over here as well. So I just have this nice, clean little um, uh, distribution over here. All right, there's my, there's my histogram. Uh, another way of looking at this data could be, um, well, what I'd like to do is to just take my X, put it out over here. Notice that by default, it's now choosing a Gantt bar marker at this point, which is a stripe. Uh, and at the top up here, I've got fit height. So it's just stretching it out to fit the entire window. It's going to look a little bit ugly for a short period of time. And then I just bring my observation ID and I put that on the detail. And now I get a strip plot coming through here. Um, what I've also got, I was preparing earlier. Let me see if I can just. Uh, trying to grab you, guy. Come here. 
All right. So there's my distribution. It's just a strip plot. So at every value of x that we have, we get a stripe. And again, we have a density problem you can see here. They, they all sort of compress in the middle. But I can start to identify some outliers at the very ends over here. Um, but a, a great way of uh, looking at that statistical information, as you may have already guessed, is a box plot. So all I need to do is to drag that out and drop that in here. And now I get this box plot being overlaid over the top of this strip plot in here. So what that now allows me to see is the center of the box plot is the uh, median. The, the box itself goes out one standard distribution from, uh, from the median. So we know that half of our data points are between those, is inside that box in here. So again, what that tells us, and we've seen it already from the histogram curve, is that it's a, a very tightly packed uh, center point for this particular distribution. It's a tall, skinny curve. Um, and so the, the whiskers then go out, in this case here, one and a half times the interquartile distance. So we've, we've got some range that we can see in here. Uh, we can do some other clever things with this because oftentimes what you're not actually interested in the stuff that's inside that range. So we can suppress all of the data marks that are inside that range if we wanted to. Um, sorry? How would you do that when you edit the checkbox, there's just a checkbox in here that says hide the underlying data marks in here. And if I, I'll do it. So if we do that, you can see that those marks go away, which makes it really easy for me to just do a lasso to select the outliers, is why you would go about doing that. Um, I'm not just interested in the outliers, I want everything. Uh, and again, for reasons which will become apparent obvious, uh, will become obvious a little bit later, I just want to bring that bin down onto my level of detail because I'm going to need that to drive some behavior a little bit later on. Does this make sense so far? So we've, we're starting to get, again, we're leveraging those descriptive statistical capabilities that we looked at not too long ago, but we're doing it in a Tableau way now. We're starting to be able to look at this far more visually. Now, um, I've got already built the equivalent for the Y. So the Y looks quite different. You can see here that it's now uh, just a distribution in one direction. So it has a long tail. Um, so this is um, flipped 90 degrees from the X. So uh, the bars are running horizontally in here, not vertically. Um, so you can see there's a lot at a very low level down here, and then they tail off as we go up through here. Pretty straightforward. Um, uh, and I've also created the distribution plot. And again, what we can see from this, looking at the box plot, um, is that it's packed towards the bottom, which we can see from the histogram in here. So our median is very low, um, and we have some skew associated with this because it tails in one direction. It's not, it's not uniform. All right. So um, the reason why I've kind of built these things up is because what I wanted to do was to actually end up with this. What you think is a really interesting way of being able to present this data. So I have the scatter plot, which shows me all my data being presented in here. So that's the scatter plot that we had created earlier. And then we've just created these additional uh, charts, which we uh, have put around the periphery in here. And for some reason, I'm missing one of them. X histo, X this. Why is that not showing up? Never mind, you'll get the idea. Um, uh, and so uh, what this now allows me to do by setting up a number of actions, this is nothing complicated. This is just, it's a dashboard and I've used some layout containers to kind of strap everything together in here. Um, let me go to that sheet. It's there, it just doesn't want to render it. That's odd, but I am running 10.5, so I have the the backup claim of saying is clearly that's just something in the beta and we'll fix that before it ships. Um, so I've, uh, the fiddly bit that you need to do with this approach here is just making sure that everything lines up neatly. Um, if you were going to do something, um, I guess a little bit more rigidly, you could probably just use floating objects and set the size uh, appropriately. Um, I've used layout containers and then I've just padded it with a little bit of blank space to, to make everything work. But once you get all this stuff, uh, and I'm just gonna hide these headers in here so everything starts to line up. Because what I can now do is start to uh, come in here and now all my actions have broken. Why do you hate me? Ah. 
highlight hover is going to be an X and Y. All right, well, the actions are working from this direction, right? Um, but just not into this, oh, I know what I might have forgotten to do, and I did. Why didn't somebody remind me to put the bins? Thank you. Yeah, that was a good pickup. So now when I do it right, you can see that it drives out to the, to the margins over here. So I can now start to use this as a way of driving out to, to show where I am on those distributions or alternately, if I hover over, over on, on these, it'll drive through those stripes. Again, it's just slightly off skewed because I haven't actually bothered to, to fix some of the, the axes in here to make sure that they're all gonna line up. But again, that's just some, some final fiddling around that you would do to get everything to line up. Um, but it's a pretty neat way of being able to, to take this data and show it, yeah? All right, so that's, that's one approach. Uh, I wanted to look at another approach. So again, here's our data. It's, it's very densely packed in here. Maybe another approach that would be really useful to do is, wouldn't it be great if we could selectively zoom in on part of this? Why, yes, Al, that would be fantastic if we could do that. Sorry? Uh, yeah, so I'm running 10.5, and I thought, well, why don't we take advantage of view in tooltip to be able to drive some of this? Um, so what I wanted to, to come up with was this idea of um, uh, like a jeweler's loop, you know, the eyeglass, and, and you can sort of float that around to, to zoom in on a particular area. So as I kind of zoomed around on these, I wanted this kind of vis in tooltip effect to start to happen in here. So... Uh, in order to do that, well, the, the, the tooltip viz is just going to be another scatter plot, but it's going to be much more constrained in here. So it's just going to be uh, X and Y in here. Oops, come back here. Y, you go there. Uh, and my observation ID on detail. So I get my, my full scatter plot in here. Uh, I'm going to need my bins in order to be able to drive this stuff over here. But um, what we're going to do is hook these things together with a filter. So it's effectively a, a filter action um, driven by the bin. And the bins are fairly small so because uh, the bins are only 0.1 wide. So this is going to get filtered down to just show a particular 0.1 wide. Now, the, the problem that you have if you, um, if I just jump back over here, um, so now I've got that viz working. Um, but you can see right now my... Um, uh, my uh, axes are sort of showing the whole thing and it's really not helping me all that much because I just get this little kind of blob happening in here. So what I would really like to do on this over here uh, is first of all edit my axes uh, so that they uh, don't have to include zero. So let's turn that off. So now when I come back over here um, so this works much better, but I, it's very difficult for me to make sense of it because when I get like a bin with just a single point in it, I'm really not seeing the, the sparsity of it. So there's a, a really neat little trick that you can do if you want to lock the size to something. Um, we can use reference lines to kind of set an outside boundary in here. And so all I've done is I've created a couple of calcs. Um, uh, where what I'm simply doing for the lower boundary is I get the min of bin X, which will be constant because I'm filtering for a single bin. So that's going to give me the, on the X, it will be the left-hand side of the view. Uh, and then I need the upper bound, uh, which is simply going to be the lower bound uh, plus the width of my bin, 0.1. So all I need to do is to bring these fields in, and I've already set up the reference lines so that they come on according to that. Uh, and so now you can see I have these reference lines that are going to go across here. Uh, and uh, now when I come back, uh, and, and so I've, I've also just created a title as well. So on my, uh, on my loop, when I hover now, uh, you can see I just get this little bounded box which shows me um, the, the detail for the selected bin that I'm hovering over. And if I happen to come up here where I've got a very sparse bin, I still get to see the whole bin spatially represented, uh, but I can see where the, the, the data is within that. Come on, that's cool. So again, just you know, leveraging a couple of um, 
fairly simple techniques. This sort of reference line bounding trick has kind of been around for a while, um, but it's a neat application for it. Um, all right, so the, the, the final bit that I wanted to kind of run through in mine, um, uh, again, I'm running 10.5. I don't have, those of you who saw the devs on stage yesterday, um, when Kent was up there and he's showing the new density mark that we're bringing out, um, fantastic. I really look forward to that one because that would be just a, a killer for this, right? You would just change the mark type to density and done, walk away. We probably won't be presenting this talk next year. Um, but, uh, so what I'd like to do is to build up a, a simple little heat map, which is going to allow me to kind of get that same sort of effect in here. So again, it's really just a matter of binning. So we'll get our bins for the X and the Y, and then what we just want to do is color code them based on the number of records that fall into that bin. It's, a, again, a very simple technique. So I take my bin X, I put it across here. I take my bin Y, I put it across here. I'm going to turn both of these to just be continuous so that they fit nicely like this. Uh, and uh, then all I have to do is to take my number of records and to put that on color. I've already attached a, a color palette to it, and bang, we, we get this. Um, so uh, again, what I would do is, in this case, we're really not interested uh, in the, the detail of these, these headers, so we'll get rid of those. And then here it is just being displayed uh, in, a, in a dashboard form, so you can see that it bundles up nicely, and I can just hover over this so I can look at the bin and I can see the number of records in here. Again, you could potentially join this up with the loop that we had before, so as you hover over these in here, um, you would then be able to see the detailed breakdown within that um, that we showed before. All good? Make sense? Awesome. Well, uh, so that, that's the foundation, this, you know, this idea of dense data and kind of looking at a couple of techniques that we can uh, apply to this. Uh, I want to hand it back to my HEX partner, Sarah, now, who's going to take this and then sort of um, use some of these techniques and some other fun stuff to, to take these learnings and shift them across into the spatial context on maps. Over to you. All right, so I realized I forgot to tell you guys who I, who I actually am. Um, so I'm on the research team. So uh, while Alan gets to do really fun pre-sale stuff and demos to people, I get to sit at my desk and write a lot of words about things and think about maps. So I don't build up as many demos, so I'm terrified of you all, and I'm gonna build things live, and we're gonna see how it goes. So I'm gonna work with some dense spatial data, and I wanted to get something that was a little bit relevant to the region, so I found some Las Vegas building permits. So just to give you a sense of what we're working with, we've got about 211,000 building permits from 2004 to 2017. So a little bit of data. And if we look at that data, just drop our latitude and longitude on there, and I'm gonna get rid of the caption as well. And I'm going to give Alan his flashing phone back. <laughs> I think your time's up. And I'll drop on our application number, add all the members. So this is, this is roughly the equivalent of Alan's you know, big blue blob of scatter plot. Now what I want to do is walk through what are some of the techniques that you can use to start trying to answer questions with spatial data. So a little bit is the what would I be doing if I saw a data set like this and I wanted to figure out what was really in, in it? Because setting up the, the histograms and some box plots doesn't work quite so well for spatial data because it turns out that spatial data is a little bit weird. So we'll just play with a couple symbolization options. And I'll just do it on here so I don't have to rebuild it. First thing I tend to try is just adjusting the size. Um, so Alan showed you this, you know, just keep dragging the size down and it turns out that this data set is still fairly dense. All you can really start to pull out is that, you know, maybe there are some fewer points on the periphery, and if you really zoom in on it, you can see that amazingly, building permits sort of follow streets. Uh, probably not really telling us a whole lot about the spatial pattern. So I normally adjust size, see if that does anything for me. If it doesn't, I'll often bump the size back up a little bit so I get the blob, because when I start adjusting the opacity, it helps to have slightly larger symbols sometimes. 
So if I go into color and I just start adjusting the opacity down, what that's going to do is it's going to make it so I can highlight the regions where there really are super dense patterns, and I can see things like some of these little outliers out here. I'm not getting them to fade out like I am with these points. But here I've got one dark blue spot. What that tells me is there's a lot of stuff going on right here. So I could select it and find out there were 21 building permits issued at this particular location. There's probably something interesting happening. But it still doesn't really help me understand the bigger overall pattern in this data set. So after I try size and opacity, if that doesn't really help me get to the heart of the distribution of my data so I can start to, to figure out the patterns, I start to think about how I can modify the question that I'm asking. So the first way that I thought with this data set to modify the question, it turns out I've got a number of different dimensions that um, define my data. So I've got an application type, I've got locations and work type and issue dates. There are a lot of ways that I could slice this data. So the next thing I tend to do with dense data sets is just start color encoding them based on a dimension that might be interesting and see if that starts to point out blobs of things where they show up. And since I'm splitting them on a dimension, I also have this interactive legend that I can work with. So I could highlight just the commercial data, and I can start to see that there is this linear stripe. It happens to run along I-95. I've got this nice blob right down here, in case if you wondered what this happens to be. It turns out that it is um, roughly the strip, um, if you happen to be really good with Las Vegas maps and can identify that from the street names you can't read. You can see um, the residential, it's, it's scattered a lot um, farther, but you get a lot more of these blobs out on the outside, so people are coming into the heart of the city from the residential. And you can also learn that everybody needs pools and spas because it's Las Vegas, and even in October, I hear it's like 900 degrees outside, even though I will admit I have not been outside a building since Sunday. <laughs> Who knew? So that, that, that's the first thing I try. Um, one of the nice things about this is you can also interact directly from the map. So if I go into the tooltip uh, where I'm looking at pools and spas, I can interact with that directly and have the pools and spas highlight from the tooltip so I don't have to go into the legend. The same is true with the year because this is a dimension. So if I want to know everything that was happening in 2008. Sarah? Yeah. I, I am running 10.5 because that was on Alan's computer. I know it works on 10.4 as well. And do you remember when we released that? Was it 10.3 or 10.4? Either 10.3 or 10.4. Okay, so it may be that you have to be running 10.4 to get the selection relaxation. Um, but it is, a nice, it is a nice thing to be able to just go in and pull things out by year directly from the tooltip. That means that I don't also have to split the data on that and set up you know, another color encoding and have a legend that I'm going to interact with directly. Um, I could also just add things on as filters. Um, so I might say, go ahead and add a filter on year. And I can make these a single value list. And I can start going through sequentially to take a look at, let me lock that down, take a look at how the patterns have changed. Um, one of the things that I noticed in here, there's this really interesting cluster right out over on the edge. And I'm just gonna show the residential right now. So if I go through 2014, 15, 16, all of a sudden there's like this boom, that whole area just explodes. So you can see where housing developments start getting created. So with this particular dense data set, just slicing and dicing it and paring it down based on a specific question helps you understand some of the patterns that are inherent in the data set. But it may be that what you really want is to understand this overall distribution as opposed to just having, oh, I only want to see this little bit of it at a time. I want to see all of the data and really understand how it's changing across space in its entirety. Or maybe you don't have dimensions you can split on. And that's where you start to look at transforming the data. So I'm going to go through a couple different methods that you can use to transform the data. And Alan showed um, a few examples of the hex bins. And I'm going to show you a few additional examples that you can use and how you would go about actually creating these. So the first thing I'm going to do are square bins, because I think square bins are the absolute easiest way to quickly aggregate your data on a map, because it's really just a rounding process. So I have a couple calculated fields that I've already created. And I'll go ahead and show you the basics of this. 
I'm taking the latitude, I'm taking the longitude, I'm making a separate calculated field for each of these, and I'm rounding it to a certain number of decimal places. So here all I'm doing is saying take the latitude, round it down so I only have one decimal place. And what that does in case you want like a number to hold on to, at the equator, one degree is about 111 kilometers. So when I round this to one decimal place, I'm getting about an 11 kilometer square. There is a map projection issue. I'm not gonna go into that in depth. If any of you really like map projections or think you might possibly like them, I am completely happy to talk with you more than you want to know about this after the presentation. So I've gone ahead and rounded these off and I've turned them into geographic fields. So you can't just do the rounding and use the calculated field immediately. You do have to specifically state that it has a geographic role of latitude and a geographic role of longitude. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab those, drop them on the map, and I'm just gonna get one point because I still need to split them out by some kind of identifier because they're aggregated by default. I've gone ahead and created a calculated field for this um, just so I have a unique ID. I took the string of the latitude and the string of the longitude and I concatenated them together. It is not the cleanest, tidiest of identifiers, but it is unique. And so when I drop that on the map, now you can see what I'm getting is, here's a nice regular grid. Essentially what I've done is dropped a bunch of squares on top and I've snapped everything into the center point of each one of those. So now if I wanna show it as a nice set of square bins, I just change my symbol to squares I adjust the size until they look pretty good. That's not good. So that's, that's reasonable. Um, one of the things you'll notice is I actually have a larger gap um, between the bins north and south than I do east and west. That is the map projection problem um, because it turns out that a degree of longitude is not the same size at all degrees of latitude. But again, we can, we can geek out on that later. So now if I want to turn this into a nice little heat map, I can just drop number of records on and I get a really quick way of simplifying that data set so I can see, hey, there are a lot more things happening up in this corner. I could also split it out if I wanted to, if I wanted to drag another dimension on here. Maybe I wanna know um, how does this sort out based on application group. I'd have to resize the bins because these are a smaller, smaller map. But now I know what is the distribution for commercial, for pools and spas, for residential, or for my favorite category of the miscellaneous everything else. That's what you get when you, know, you create groups and you don't, don't curate them very well. So that was rounding them to one decimal place. You can round down to um, as many decimal places as you want and the bins are just sequentially going to get smaller. Um, you're probably not gonna get like, you're probably not really gonna go beyond two decimal places because that's one kilometer. Um, if you've got like super, super like inside of building data, maybe you would, but one kilometer bin is generally pretty nice. If you wanna get fancy with it, um, maybe open up my custom rounding. You can use a parameter so that you can change what the level of detail is for your bins. So here I'm just rounding and instead of saying round to one decimal place or round to two decimal places, I'm just saying round to whatever I have set for a parameter. And so I can jump between one decimal place or two decimal places. I have to resize the bins as I go, but it makes it really nice to change the level of detail and decide how, how small of a bin do I really want. But you know, squares may not be edgy and hip enough for you. So, that's like my favorite hex spinning joke. And like generally about three people laugh, but I still use it every time because it is my favorite joke. Why do people use hex spins? Because they're hip and they're edgy. And then there are people like, what? I'm like, they've got like six edges. They're cool. So hex spins, um, they're actually built in calculations in Tableau that you can use for hex spinning. And what you do is you take the latitude and longitude and, inst and instead of rounding, we're going to use this nice hex bin function. And the, the simplest version of it is to say, I want hex bin x, which says give me the x coordinate of the center of the bin, the longitude, or for a specific longitude and a specific latitude. I've added in something a little bit complicated here, so I've added in this hex scalar. And what that does is it does the equivalent of letting me choose how many decimal places I'm gonna round to with the square bins. It just says how big or how small do you want these bins to be, and you can adjust them proportionally. So I create a calculated field for my x's. 
I do the same thing for my y's. It looks exactly the same, except you use a different function. So it's hex bin y instead of hex bin x. Set them up as latitude and longitude. Drop them onto the map. And I've created my ID field again. And so now I have a bunch of points. Uh, I want them to actually be hexagons. And I realized that this is going to be the downfall of using Alan's computer, because he probably doesn't have my fancy hexagonal shapes. But it turns out that hexagons are so edgy, you can just use circles, and it's not generally that bad of a difference. So I'm going to go ahead and just use circles. And you can see that what I'm getting is a nice regular grid of hexagonal or circular shapes that I'm aggregating my data into. So now I can also just drag number of records out onto color. I'm going to maybe make this nicer color scheme. Maybe it'll stand out a little better if we use you know, a nice bright red gold. Yeah. So you can see a little bit of we've got a denser pattern in this area, denser up in this corner up here. We've got lots sparser populations. Uh, or sparser permits down in the corners. So again, you could take those. You could also split them out. So here I'm splitting that on um, commercial versus residential. So you can see, you know, I've got a lot more residential up in this area. The commercial really tends to run along more of a linear corridor. And it helps me simplify those patterns. So instead of looking at the raw points, which overlapped so much, I can use these polygon shapes, which aren't going to have the overlap. Now, I wanted to uh, show you really quickly this map projection problem. Like I said, I'm not going to go into detail, but I wanted to tell you what is really going on. So you're not intended to be able to see what this is right now. Uh, so let me zoom in. I created a bunch of hexagonal bins. So you can see here is a nice grid of hexagons. They are all the same size. Or, yeah, they're all the same size. They're all the same shape. They're just nice little cute regular grid of hexagons. Now I'm going to start panning north. They still look good. They still look OK. Oh, I'm starting to see a little bit of stretching. I'm starting to see a little bit more stretching. You notice these are not nice, perfect, regular hexagons anymore. And as I get farther and farther up towards the poles, what's happening with those bins is they're really stretching out. So if you are working with a really large area, and by really large area, I mean larger than probably, I don't know. I mean, it depends on your latitude, what the, what the problem is. But for the, for the continental United States, you'll actually notice a difference between, between the bins. Um, you will see noticeable stretching. You see a little bit of it in Australia. If you're working in a great state like Tennessee, which is nice and really long east-west, no problems at all. Um, but if you're working across large areas, you are actually going to see some distortion in the bins. Um, if you want to like really nerd out on that, um, go to the research webpage at Tableau. I wrote a paper that I've heard is quite accessible, um, but it is a bit of scholarly literature on all of the bad things that happen with hex bins and map projections. So I want you to notice with these, um, the other bins that I made, they were these little hexagonal symbols, or in this case, circular symbols. These are like honest to goodness, legit hexagons. And this is like the best hex trick that I learned from Alan. Like, this is my favorite thing that I can do now. What we call super hexy bins. So Alan had this really great idea uh, of how you could take this data and draw polygons. If we know the center of the bin, Hexagons are pretty easy to draw. It turns out all you need are six vertices around the edge. So I'm going to give you like the highlight reel on how to make these. And all of the details are written in a lot. Alan has a great blog post with a lot more detail on this. And I am working on a, a, a longer post of you know, a lot of the intricacies of spatial binning. So I'll have that probably in the next month. But the way this works is we do our regular binning. So here's our our center point, you know, we just use our regular hex bin X and our hex bin Y. So we're going to create those, and that's going to tell every point which bin it belongs in. I'm going to create a point ID. Now, the point ID is a little bit special. So what the point ID is saying 
Anytime you have more than one point that shows up with the same center point, so it's going to fall in the same hexagon, assign the first record that shows up, or in this case, the first application number that shows up, because I know they're unique, give that a one. Give the last one a six, because there are six vertices. So for every bin, I now have at least, I have two unique numbers, a one and a six. And Tableau is really good at densifying data, so I can say take that one, take that six, and then they're gonna fill in numbers two through five. It really is, it, it's magic. So when we do this, I hope, I hope that you agree that this is magic. So that's the basic setup, and I've, I've got the bins as well of those IDs. And then there's some special calculations to figure out where we're gonna actually put these points. So we've got an angle calculation, which is saying take this index number and multiply by uh, two pi radians divided by six. We're going into, like my old math teacher from high school is probably really proud of me right now somewhere. And how do we know where to plot those points? Uh, it's really just a little bit of magical trig. So we're saying figure out for which number this is. Are you one, two, three, four, five, six, which vertex? What latitude am I gonna draw you at? What longitude am I gonna draw you at? So that's where a little bit of the magic comes in. So let's see if I can successfully make these uh, without bungling it, because I do so many live demos. So I'm going to drop my hex lat and hex lawn on detail, and I'm going to draw my, I'm gonna undo everything I just did. I'm gonna pick my plotting latitude and longitude and drop that onto my rows and columns so I have something to draw. Longitude, latitude. So now I've got my one point. I need a point ID, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'll drop that on bin. So I have my one and my six. I also want, I might get my cheat sheet real quick. Yeah, I normally do the columns last for my densification, but we will go ahead and show missing values. This is the secret for our, our points one and six. And I'll drop it back on detail. I'm just gonna start building this over from scratch. I knew I was gonna screw this one up, so I did write down the specific steps. So I've got my hex bin centers, my latitude and my longitude. Okay, got our plot latitude, our plot latitude, plot longitude and our plot land, plot. We got our coordinates, we drop them on there. We got our latitude and our longitude here and we'll drop it on detail and we should see all of the center points. I don't know what magic is not going on here. Yeah, I could drop, try point ID on here. I'm gonna blame Alan's laptop on this. <laughs> um, I do have some, some nice screen captures of it that I can show you. Let's just assume these bins drew correctly, because they drew correctly right here, where I've got my plot longitude and my plot latitude showing up. Okay, so we'll just, I'll just keep like taking the suggestions from the audience here. We'll go to polygon, point ID on path, and it's really just gonna give me the two points. Yeah, for some reason it is not splitting these out into the separate, um, I did do missing values. Yeah, it's just not, it's not recognizing its little unique IDs that I set up, and I do not know why. I'll figure it out afterwards, we'll move on, you'll see some magic later, it'll be great. There are some, some resources attached to these because I, I wanna be able to jump over and show you another, another binning technique that I think is really interesting and useful for you. And after yesterday's devs on stage, we'll give you some interesting things to look forward to. Yeah. The concept that's going on is we have a center point for each one of these bins, which we get from the hex bin X and Y values and we have vertex one, two, three, four, five, six, and Tableau is saying, I know the coordinates for these six vertices, I can just draw them as a path, and then it gives you a, a, a single polygon, so as you then zoom in and out on them, they don't have to be resized at all. 
Uh, Alan is so smart. It's always the table calcs. I'm going to go ahead and compute these using my bin ID. And then I get a hexagon. I knew I was going to totally blow something during this, but that, was, that, that is the process. Alan's blog explains it very well, and I'm going to write up you know, an even more you know, nerdy, detailed variant on how to build these. But it's all about the table calc. When in doubt, compute using. Just keep picking until you get the right thing. So we're, I'm just going to forget that any of that happened. So I'm using the, the point ID, and there's an option to show missing values. If I get rid of the missing values, I'm going to go back to just having you know, nothing really showing up. I have a line, because all I have is vertex 1 and vertex 6. As soon as I say, hey, go ahead and give me all of the values in between, Tableau is smart enough to give me the rest of them. So that's, that's the magic. Thank you for the, the, the group assistance on this. You, yeah, you, you guys got my back. I am like feeling so good about this. So now I'm going to move on to something that is going to be like so killer awesome next year because you're going to be able to do this all in Tableau. Um, I wanted to do some binning that was not tied to polygons, I mean not tied to hexagons or circles because sometimes your question really depends on a known geography, sales territories, states, countries, something else. So I wanted to look at this data by Las Vegas census blocks uh, because I thought it would be really interesting to know how do they break down inside these officially designated geometries. It may be that if I'm sending code enforcement out, this is how I break them up. You know, I've got some kind of meaning behind these that I want to use. So what I've done is I grabbed the census block data set from the US Census. I had to do a little bit of processing outside of Tableau so that I could get a census block assigned to each one of the points. But then once I do that, I can now link those points up to each one of these census tracts or census blocks and aggregate into the block. So I'll go ahead and turn the outline off so you can see the pattern a little bit more. And it tells me a little bit about how is this data aggregated in geographies that may be more relevant to me. Now the way that this works is I'm using an extract on Alan's computer so I can't show you the join. I have a shape file. I have the point data set, and I'm just joining the two of them together based on the census block ID that I assigned. And I calculated that census block ID using um, QGIS, which is a free and open source geographic information system tool. It took about a minute and a half to do opening it, calculating it, saving it, and getting it back into Tableau. But as you saw in Devs on Stage yesterday, um, that new intersect spatial join that's coming in, you'll be able to just drop your shape file into Tableau, drop these permits into Tableau, and say, go ahead and intersect these, and you won't have to do anything outside the software anymore. So some of what this, this will allow you to do, you can start now breaking down the data. We can look at where is the commercial construction versus the residential construction, and you can see uh, that we've got a lot more of the, the, the commercial along our I-95 corridor. If we zoom in closely, you can really see it as just a big gap in the residential, it's like no residential, and then these giant chunks of commercial. So now I can break it by census block. I could also create some, some fancy calculated fields. So this calculated field right here, I wanted to know whether every census block was more commercial or more residential. So I did a quick table calculation or a quick um, calculated field to just look at how many permits that are commercial fall in this block, how many commercials or residential that fall in this block, divide the two of them. And I gave it some categories. So I can look at the areas where I have way more commercial development than residential, way more residential development than commercial, and then the two groups sort of in the middle. So that's a nice way to also mine through the data so I can not just see the total count, but I can see some of the patterns that are behind this count. Yeah. Um, it's not specific to the build. That, yeah, so which build is making the shape of, or which pill? Ah, so the pill that's doing that is this collect pill right here. So if I want to draw these, because I have a shape file, I have a geometry that comes in, I can just double click on the geometry and it's going to draw all of those for me. Yep, and then I'll split them out by the geo ID 
and now I have individual census blocks. So this is from uh, version 10.2 and beyond. You can drop in spatial files directly. It's a shape file, KML files, GeoJSON files, um, map info files, and from devs on stage last night, we're working on a, being able to connect directly into the geometries in, in spatial databases. So any geometry that you'd be able to bring in, it'll just draw really nicely with this collect geometry. Yeah, so the join, it's like I drop in the shape file, I drop in the, uh, the, um, the building permits, and just join the two of them together. And then I can aggregate all those building permits inside each of the blocks. And then when I want to get really fancy, uh, you can start to link everything together. So here I've got my residential and commercial permits, and I can click on any of these and see a table that I've created that's now updating that'll tell me how much each of these permits were issued for. Um, because in Las Vegas, there are some really interesting ones. So here we've got a $220 million uh, commercial construction permit. Yeah, just a small project. Um, $55 million commercial construction project. And I wanted to get super fancy with this to help me understand what was inside this data. So I linked it to Google Street View. So now I can click on any of these bars, and I've got a Street View that's going to open up. And I can take a look at what might this construction project have been. And my guess is for you know, a mere $55 million, it's probably related to this building here. However, for a mere $220 million, it is probably related to this gigantic shopping center. So you can use these techniques to combine multiple worksheets together and then add in some supplemental information to give people the context. So you're not only seeing how many things are somewhere, but what types of things are there and then getting the detail of really drill in and show me what the individual points are. So that is, that is uh, the set of demos that I wanted to show you in terms of how I typically walk through spatial data and mine, mine its density to figure out what the patterns are. Uh, with that, I think we can open it up for some questions or Alan and I will be here for a little while if you want to talk with us. Help. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Question. So the, I think the question is, <clears throat> how does Tableau work out the default bin size? Is that the question? Um, so I don't know the exact answer. What, um, there's an algorithm that we use because we want to create an optimal number of bins. So. Um, we don't just pick a, a, a round unit. Um, it's based on the fact that we want to produce, I, th I think it's something like uh, a dozen bins or something like that by default. And so we, we leverage uh, an algorithm to work out what the bin, side ne bin size needs to be to produce that many bins. Yeah, we had, a, we had a statistician that was working on this specifically to figure out, you know, what is the optimal size to make sure that you don't have too many bins, too few bins, and it's actually related to the distribution of your data. So the number looks kind of random sometimes, but it is some statistically optimized number. I'm, the, I'm, sure, there's a, I'm sure there's an entire white paper written by somebody <laughs> about it to, to explain how we came up with it. Oh, yes, so the, the, the question is, why didn't I just use the native bins and instead I created a calculation? Because it turns out that you can't reference a bin, a native bin, in a calculation, and I needed it when I got to the loop example to, to put the reference lines around the outside, the, the, you know, the red lines that I had around the outside of that loop. Um, in order to do that, I needed to get the min of bin X and the min of bin Y, and you can't do that with a native bin object, that's why I had to create it as a calculation. Yeah, great, thanks for reminding me. Uh, there and then there. Yeah. So if you have 
if you have like a really a ton of bins, creating the hex bins inside Tableau probably isn't going to speed that up because then you're doing the calculation across you know that that ton of points that you have. Um, but if if you tend to bin them into the same like if you want the same set of bins all the time, I would just set up a hexagonal grid, bin your points in, and then bring in the hexagons. Because instead of having 10 million points, you'll have 500 polygons and an aggregation on that. You can always then join the points back in and be able to select the hexagon and just have those points show up. Imagine the hexagon with the loop over the top of it, right? That same technique and just being able to visualize the, the customers in that hex bin would be a great way of doing it. Um, just one thing to be aware of, because I, <clears throat> I did some fiddling around with this, the, the, the um, formula that Sarah showed you for the bin ID, which was just to just concatenate two strings together, don't do that at scale. <laughs> strings are slow, numbers are fast. Uh, and I have a, a workbook that I can show you that um, was, I think, your taxi data from mm -hmm. last year. Yeah, a million and change. Uh, where you generate, because uh, it was millions of records. Yeah, it was I like think 170 was. million records. Yeah, 170 million records of, of lat longs. So for each one of those records, you have to compute the bin that it belongs in. And so that's 170 million inefficient string calculations. So if you do it that way, it was taking like 30 seconds to render the dashboard, which is not bad. Um, but by changing it from a string calc to a number calc, almost instantaneous. It was like the, the, little, the little please wait dialog box didn't even pop up. So um, just be careful when you're using uh, these techniques at scale. Strings are slow, numbers are fast. Don't do what Sarah just showed you. Uh, there, was a quest there was a question here, and then we'll come back to you, Keith. Yeah, so, so the Google Map integration, uh, th this is a uh, web page object, and I think I can see the URL on it. And what I have is it is pointing out to a web page that I put up on my GitHub account that just has this little skeleton to show a street view, and I pass in a latitude and longitude value. So Tableau is going to my GitHub page, dropping the latitude and longitude value into the URL that loads up a street view image and loading it into this web page. The latitude and longitude value comes from selecting this particular permit because every permit has a latitude and longitude attached to it. So it's an action that creates this URL that says grab the lat, grab the long, and then throw it into this window and the URL assigned to that window is this GitHub page. Uh, last, last one, Keith. Wait, the, like, the oh, I, I, I used that so that I could um, disaggregate the points because by default all of the bins are going to be aggregated into one location, so I needed a unique identify for each one, or unique identity for each one. I used the, uh, the string just because it would be really fast. I could also have actually taken the latitude calculation and the longitude calculation, dropped them on detail, and made them discrete and it would have done the same thing. I just need something to say, these, this is a unique point and I need it to be separate from, from all of the others. So I assume if you change this, yeah. it gets more granular? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a gigantic wrong, bend. Wrong, wrong way. Right, so if you think about the hex bin, the hex bin is just a container and, and there are a bunch of dots inside the hex bin. For each of those dots, you have to work out which hex bin you're in. The, the hex bin is um, uh, the, the hex bin, all we really get back is the centroid. The outside is stuff that we've projected through the densification and then some trigonometry. We've projected all of that stuff. But for each of the points in the hex bin, you have to work out which bin they belong to, and that's what that unique identifier is for. It's just so we can then recognize them all as being belonging to the one so that when you then sum the number of records, you can work it all out. Make sense? Cool. Um, I think we're at time, and you guys have probably got another session that you need to get to. So thanks very much for coming along. Uh, please make sure that you fill out the survey at the end of the session for us. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.